Music industry combining with science. Hello and welcome to Career Central, the podcast where we demystify interesting careers. I'm your host Sachin Ramurthy, and this week we'll be talking about another interesting career which most of us are unaware of: neuromusicology. No art stirs the emotions so deeply as music. Music is rightly styled the language of emotion. Neuromusicology is a combined study of music and neuroscience, or how music affects our brain. It is a field of research with practical relevance for music performance, composition, education, medicine, and therapy. Practitioners of this field are called neuromusicologists. Neuromusicologists have the unique opportunity of involving themselves in two fields, music and science, that many are interested in but fail to integrate into one common study. Neuromusicologists are usually trained in one or more instruments, as this helps in understanding the nuances of the field better. Since this particular field is relatively new, you won't find many job listings for it, but don't let that discourage you from pursuing a career in this field. The job you ultimately end up with is going to be largely determined by the set of skills you have developed throughout your education. Although there are a few universities that offer courses in neuromusicology or the related field of music cognition, one way of initially getting into this field is simply by experiencing it firsthand under a professional. But also note that neuromusicology requires extensive knowledge of neuroscience and thus could be difficult to enter without the guidance of a professional. Today, we are talking with Ms. Geeta Butt, a neuromusicologist who set up the Hamsa Kutira Foundation in Bangalore. Her vast understanding as a practitioner of both child psychology and Carnatic music has enabled her to explore deeper dimensions like music and emotions, music as a promoter of human values, music and spirituality, and also music for transforming the lives of the terminally ill, the differently abled, and children with special needs. So let's get right to it. First of all, what exactly does it mean to be a neuromusicologist? See, the field that I work in is uh, neuromusicology, where we merge uh, psychology and uh, the components of music. The components of any form of music, it doesn't have to be just Carnatic music, it can be any form of music. For example, rhythm or tala or laya or all those which become the uh, basic math components of a particular composition. And then you have timbre and you, you have the emotions which form the rasa of a composition. So uh, how we merge this is across disorders. Whether it's beneficial to that particular case, uh, physically, psychologically, emotionally or in whatever a way we can help them to be. So it's basically therapeutic intervention that we use through music, uh, neuromusicology. Well, that sounds fascinating. So what work do you actually do on a daily basis? See, um, at Hamsa Kutira Foundation, we have classes for all. And right from the first day that I have started uh, taking classes, I have never neglected the other hemisphere. That is the uh, typically the disordered uh, students because they don't have a platform to enrich themselves. So uh, I have always raised them in an inclusive platform and today they are the performers. <laughs> so. Wow, that's amazing. So um, kind of related to this, you've conducted a lot of research um, on how music affects the terminally ill and children with special needs. So could you summarize your findings for us? See, uh, basically music is beyond in entertainment. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, just uh, grouped it uh, for a particular sector of uh, community or people out here across theatre or across uh, sabhas and uh, uh, you know across performances for audiences so it's just um, minutes pleasure that they get but whereas what we do is we go right up to cancer patients patients who are not going to be there tomorrow so we work for Karna Shreya, we work for Alzheimer patients then we do home-to-home -home, uh, visits uh, for very ill patients who enjoy music. Uh, just to um, bring them out from their, you know, uh, zones just for those five uh, ten minutes. So, um, we are just trying to outreach to the people that music can be used as an alternative therapy even across clinical settings and a perfect therapeutic intervention. 
So why exactly is it that music has such a profound effect on all of us? Um, see, there, it's purely individualistic. Uh, some people like uh, the element of rhythm in music. So very, very often you like, uh, you must have seen teenagers going behind rock music and all kind of fad music, where there's peppy drums and other things. Now over some period of time they would like uh, melodious, typical soft uh, tune because they merge into the emotions of that particular composition. So you have all these people again getting back to Hindi compositions, Hindi film hits and other things. And then there comes an age when you go back to old uh, Hindi melodies because there is n- not much background music but only the uh, lyrics component. So there are many elements in music which is purely individualistic to a particular client or a particular student or an individual. So based on that, we need to use the intervention. For example, a cerebral palsy student where there is a brain damage to that particular uh, student. We use a lot of rhythm because they respond very well to rhythm. So we use a lot of um, uh, different kinds of tala and laya. And um, there are certain other students, especially in the autistic sector, uh, and very senior citizens who enjoy very um, emotional music, you know. So a very soothing uh, music. So it's purely individualistic and we need to um, tune ourselves to the patient's needs and then take it forward. Yeah. Hmm, That's very interesting. So how widespread is the field of neuromusicology and what is the training that's required to be prominent in this field? Neuromusicology is uh, in a stage of infancy um, and yes, uh, I'm trying my level best to uh, propagate. Uh, what people practice here is Raga therapy. Um, but it has to reach an advanced level of neuromusicology where there is a, a clinical psychologist or a clinician who can actually uh, research right there on the effects of the raga. For example, typically it's happening at uh, Nimans when uh, just before uh, surgery where uh, Hindustani ragas are introduced and uh, the stress, stress hormones are checked and uh, all those things. So um, neuromusicology is not yet entered India. But um, yes, we are trying to get in with our collaborations with the different uh, hospitals and other things. Well, hopefully we see some more neuromusicologists after this podcast episode. (laughs) But, um, so has there been any research done on what particular genre of music affects us the most? No, uh, no. It's, it's, uh, like I said, purely individualistic. So, uh, for example, when we are working with Alzheimer's patients, there are some very old uh, compositions that they uh, pick up. To just to um, revisit their uh, memory, we try to stimulate that memory which is dead, you know. Uh, so we pick up compositions which are 300, 400 years old and suddenly they start putting tala on their own. They've forgotten everything around them and then they suddenly uh, put uh, a tala. So it's purely individualistic. Whereas I have a, uh, I'm working on a 19 year old, just a 19 year old, uh, multiple sclerosis, which is the highest form of uh, neurological impairment now. And she seems to have forgotten all her, uh, even her basic uh, sarigama and uh, other things. So, unique to the case. Hmm, okay. So, what is the best way that our listeners can start to use neuromusicology in their lives on a day to day basis? See, uh, neuromusicology is a very vast subject. To get into neuromusicology, you need to know the basics of music. So um, the best way to do it is uh, either take uh, classical Western music or classical uh, Karnataka or Hindustani music. That which has a classical component because that is where the math is there. And then you research beyond. You take that to, um, you start researching on yourself first you feel something good is happening to you because of that, then you reach it out to the masses. That's how. And yes, if you're um, getting into the field of neuromusicology, an adequate knowledge of the disorders, current disorders, as per DSM-5 manual, that's a psychology disorder manual, you need to keep yourself updated on that, else it's very difficult to work. You cannot work with any client. So neuromusicology seems like such a narrow field. So what actually made you choose to go into this line of work? 
uh, my entry was uh, accidental because I was in the project management domain. I'm a master's in computer science basically and I was doing a lot of website designing back from home. And uh, after having worked uh, three years and being uh, backstabbed and pulled in various directions, three years I could find the stress in me. But the um, best thing that happened in my life was music because I had started very early, five years. So by 16, I was already performing in major sabhas. So that's when I uh, diverted my line completely because I had visited a school called uh, Shrishti, which is an autism school at Chennai in Hadi, Bangalore. And from there onwards, I proceeded with my psychological uh, degrees and my PhD. And I then started combining uh, both the subjects and uh, brought out this whole new thing concept called as music therapy. Okay, final question now. What is your message or advice to students who are considering a career in neuromusicology? See, my one-time suggestion is uh, neuromusicology, you need to keep upgrading your knowledge throughout, uh, be it both in the music field and the uh, field of psychology, along with an extreme sense of the disorders. You need to relate to the disorders. So you need to work with those uh, kind of uh, individuals. So only if you are day in and day out with them, then you know the actual essence of neuromusicology. And um, yeah, for people who are taking this as a complete profession, it's not an easy job and it's not money fetching. If you are ready to uh, give up those two and just work hard towards a common goal that is a baseline that you have assessed in a patient and the uh, goals that you're trying to achieve um, and you have a passion for serving people then you can enter else it's a very very tough position so uh, that's the reason i advise youngsters to do it along with the uh, with another profession give it give some time to the society that's what that's it for today, everybody. But be sure to follow us on iTunes and Facebook. Watch short and interesting clips of the podcast on YouTube. And visit www.indiestudentroom.com for more. See you next time. We will interview former athlete Ms. Ashwini Nachapa.